All right, so I think we're live. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we have an exciting guest speaker. Um, for me, it's very exciting. Uh, so Dr. Caitlin Dooley is the Deputy Superintendent of Curriculum and of Teaching and Learning at the Georgia Department of Education. Um, her background initially was in literacy, um, but since then she has become a guru of all things education, specifically a, a huge champion for computer science in the state. She's helped me um, uh, reach a lot of the platforms and a lot of the people. She helped write the K-12 uh, computer science framework. Um, so she has a, a deep and abiding passion for growing computer science, particularly as a literacy in Georgia. Um, so without any further ado, I give you all Caitlin Dooley. Hi, everyone. Um, so Brian, you're going to stay on here with me, right? Yes. Oh, by the way, if you need closed captioning, it's uh, the link for that is pinned at the top of the chat. And if you have any questions for Dr. Dooley, put them in the chat and we'll I'll circle back to them afterwards. Perfect. Thank you. So you'll be keeping an eye on that because I want to make sure yeah. that we're running both. OK, so hi, everyone. So um, I'll tell you a little story first. Um, so when I was a professor at Georgia State University, I was talking to my so I've been studying literacy for many, many years. I, I uh, was an elementary school teacher, a preschool art teacher before that. I taught little kids art. And then I think art and literacy are very much aligned um, because of language arts. You know, language is an art form. That's why we read novels. And so I went from visual arts with preschoolers to language arts. I loved having um having that connection with kids. Went to University of Virginia to become a teacher and I taught uh, elementary grades, fourth, well, second, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And um, then went to the University of Texas, got my PhD. Oh, before that I worked at a nonprofit called Children's Literacy Initiative, really got into literacy, got my PhD in, in literacy, um, really curriculum instruction with a specialization in literacy. And then, um, and then I started really learning more about how kids learn and why literacies are so powerful. Um, Cause I really believe that literacy is a, is a tool for freedom for many of our students. Um, and it has a long, you know, there's a lot to be said about literacy itself. It, it, um, when, when literacy was first invented prior to the um, Gutenberg press, prior to, all of the technologies that we have, we used to have people write on stones and there were special scribes that would get to do that. And then we had um, that move into the realm of religion. And so oftentimes religious texts were, were drawn up. And you've heard of like in the story of the Bible and right, you know, carving it into stones and, and, then, um, and then using skins to um, to write on with with ink, and then eventually we started to get um, paper, and paper was was like mashed up, um, soiled, like sawdust basically that they would come up with to make paper, and all of that was way too expensive for everybody to use, right? Because. Who could have who you'd have to actually have this as your profession if you were to learn how to read you were that was you were a professional reader and if you were to be a writer that you would be a scribe and oftentimes the monks were the ones who did this um, in multiple cultures um, they were the they were people who were held in esteem in their in their communities and then we had the press invented and suddenly that became part of a common vernacular. That was, it became common for people to learn how to read. And what was really interesting at that time was that when people were learning how to read um, and write, uh, they were really learning how to read first. We really hadn't gotten to writing yet. Um, you're still very specialized if you learned how to write. And especially if you were going to get access to one of those printers, you had to have some sort of um, privilege in society to get access to one of those that costs a lot of money um, to get access to one of those. And then we had um, we had people learning in schools. That was one of the first times it was probably well, Horace Mann would have been 
um, early 1800s, prior to the Industrial Revolution, we started to say, oh, well, we might need to have some public schools here in, in um, the U.S. And, um, and so we started formalizing what it meant to be literate. And um, I'm not going to go too far back into like what it meant to be literate in terms of voting privileges or in terms of um, other uh, public policy privileges, but it certainly did um, help with our democracy to have people who were literate. So fast forward to, I'm a professor at Georgia State and I'm all, my mind is like all about literacy and I'm all excited about this. And I went home to visit my parents and my dad, who is retired military, he was a captain in the Navy, then had his own business, sold that. So he's not a dumb guy by any means. Um, and he was talking to me about an article that he had been reading in the Washington Post. My parents live up in near D.C. And he was talking about it. And then he was talking about the advertisement that came up next to it. And he didn't really realize at the time that it was an advertisement because it was written in such a way that it really seemed like a legitimate article. And many of you have probably seen that. And then he started, I said, well, dad, you do realize that that was dropped in, that the Washington Post editorial group did not, did not put, place that in for you. And he was like, no, that's not, what do you mean? And I was explaining to him how iframes work and, um, and how when he would search for something on the internet, how it would keep a log of it. Now, this is a man who, like I said, is, he's not dumb. But he's of a generation that was not born in, into the Internet age. And so a lot of the mechanisms that just informed what he read were totally unknown to him. And there wasn't anything built into the into the literate um, tool that said this is an advertisement or this is, you know, there wasn't a screen, a, a frame around the iframe that said this isn't part of what um, what the, you know, but what the article is about. And so then we started looking through um, on his, on his, he had just gotten an iPad at the time. It was the first one. And so we started looking through the iPad articles and I was showing him how it was working. And it was an aha moment for me because, um, it made me realize that a lot of these engines that that run our literacy now, and I'm going to call them technologies, but recognize that I recognize it as a technology just like those ancient um, scrolls were and the press and the paper making and um, and even back to the stones. Those were all technologies that changed who had access whether or not it was considered a profession or not, um, a profession worth getting paid for, how much you got paid for it, whether or not there was an editorial element to it. So who got to have access, whether or not that would have been um, deemed a privileged position. Um, it was also whether or not who got access um, and who had a voice and who had the ability to, um, to get to speak in a way that other people would recognize, that other people would receive. And I think that is computer science right now. I really do. Um, it's not just um, computer science as, you know, somebody who's gonna go sit in a room and, and ha hack out um, software. It is about, a change in our society. And we are determining who gets a voice, who gets a profession, who gets to have privilege in society. We're also changing who gets to um, read all of this because consumption is definitely a role in our society. And one of the things that we've prided ourselves with in in public education, at least in the near term that I can that I can see, is that we've not only um, created producers, we've created consumers. And that's not a 
that's not a negative role. We all consume. We all need food and toilet paper right now and <laughs> all sorts of things. And so the idea is not to not consume. It's that we make informed decisions. And when I think about my father's understanding of the Washington Post article and what art, why there were advertisements popping up for him, he doesn't get the how that happens. He thinks it's magic. I mean, he wouldn't say that. I'm but he doesn't understand how that happens. And so we need to have a deep instantiated discipline of K-12 CS, not just for the people whose this is their profession, but this is so people can have a voice and that, so that people can be informed readers and informed consumers as well as producers. And that's part of why I, I feel so compelled around Georgia's stance for computer science. Um, in the last year, we have passed K-12 CS standards, as you know. Um, we have brought in uh, two NSF grants, and now, as of, what, two days ago, Brian? Brian brought in another one. So the National Science Foundation sees what we're doing here in Georgia, and they're um, back in us as much as they can. Um, we have another piece of, um, of this whole picture is our support through CS for Georgia. This is um, a collective that has ebbed and flowed as we can make it so. <laughs> um, thank you to Ko Hassan for jumping back and into the, the group and holding the reins for us for a little while. Um, but this group really helped pull together a really powerful lobbying consortium that was, um, you know, at the DOE, we can't lobby. Well, we, the superintendent can, but like, I'm not supposed to. So CS for Georgia has its own voice. And we don't, we don't dictate what that voice is. Um, but CS for Georgia was instrumental in creating some of the legislative um, mechanisms to grow computer science. Now, the one thing I will say that we really have to work on in Georgia as we continue to grow, we, we made a decision early on to really grow the professional learning and the professionals who can do this work. Um, the, that continues to move forward. That is our primary um, strategy right now is growing the professionals who can do the work of which you all are essential for all of this and our partnerships with constellations and you know uh, uh, there we have multiple partnerships. Um, Georgia State is also as you read in the chat um, one of our partners, the Community Foundation has been a good partner. TAG has been a great partner. So we have a lot of partners doing this work. We are not doing it alone. Um, there is no way we could do this alone. We are a mighty team of two and I'm responsible for every content area. Yeah, we're a mighty team of, of one. <laughs> um, and I'm responsible for every other content area too. So Brian really, um, <laughs> Brian really does all the work. Um, so check out CS for Georgia, help us build that community. Um, and then, so that's one of my asks from you is to continue to build that community. Put out all calls for any professional learning that you have going on. And then my second all call is that we have got to work on broadening participation. When we look at our subgroups and we look at the participation among Georgia's um, racial subgroups and among um, students who are growing up in poverty, we are we have a ways to go before we create a more equitable society. Um, we continue to see that our our population that is excelling in um, taking on these courses there it is still skewed. Um, beyond the natural representation. Um, part of this is societal biases, but a lot of it is stuff that we need to move in on. Um, so the more you can 
figure out ways to invite females into this amazing discipline, the more you can um, figure out ways to invite uh, African-American and Latinx students. Um, I think that we will find and Asian Americans um, and white students are often well represented, especially males in our data. Um, but I think that you'll find that the classes even become more interesting because the problems that they bring up are gonna be a little different because their lives are a little different. Um, and, and the industry is really calling for this as well. Um, they are working on their end of it. And I think we will continue to work on our end of it, but we will need your help. And if there's something that you see that works, um, share that with the CS for Georgia group, share it with Brian and he will shout it through the mountaintops. Um, if there's anything that we can do to support all of our students, ultimately we want every single one of them to get this literacy. It's essential for all of our students if they're going to have a voice in our society, given that we have a whole new technology now that dictates who gets to read and who gets to write. So I will stop there. Um, that was great. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to take Laura some Laura has a question about, is there a one-to-one -one device, uh, visual -one devices for all our students? Oh. If you have any questions, okay, so, chat. Um, so the first thing I did when we closed our offices on um, March 13th mm -hmm. is I went home and I um, cried because I knew that we would be extending what we usually call summer learning loss into six months instead of three. Um, it was it was hard. And so I sat down on March 16th on that Monday and we started to work on a plan. And I will say I've had the full support of the Godot, GOSA, the governor's office, Georgia Technology Authority, the Department of Administrative Services, like, um, and the Department of Community Affairs. All of these groups have been working with us. And I will put in this little chat, or actually, Brian, if you can, do you know where how, what the deployment restart guide I'll look, I'll see if I can find it here. Um, uh, anyway, I'll put the, I'll put the, here it is. I'm going to put the link in the chat for you guys. There you go. Um, so we figured out that, so this is a restart guide that if you're in a district, you can give this to your IT professional and your curriculum professional and say, hey, Let's work on this together. We're going to get the kids connected. So with this whole group, what we did is we we tried to figure out what the need is first. So we do an annual inventory of um, devices out in schools. That's just a normal thing that happens. And so we we took um, we took all of those devices. We took out from the number anything that's sitting on a desk, like a desktop computer or anything that's like too old. We figured out that out of uh, 1.8 million kids, we probably had about 660,000 who did not have their own device, at least not secured by the school. So then the next thing that we did was we um, looked at um, we looked at the connectivity maps that the providers have. We merged those into a, a geospatial mapping. Then we've also taken the provider addresses and matched them to our student addresses to figure out where we need to move in in terms of providers. We figured out we have 80,000 students who do not have internet access across our state. We have some swaths where you won't have much of anything. Um, so now what we've done is we've created negotiated rates so that providers, because ideally they, the kids would have home access. We created negotiated rates so that schools can purchase bundled home internet at a very low cost. So this is, 25 down, three up at minimum, um, usually around uh, $15 a month for the providers who are already on, on the ground to extend hardwire or um, do a public Wi-Fi access for these areas. And so that's where we are now. If you want to do that in your community, if you're one of those lucky ones who didn't have devices or um, 
or connectivity, that document that I just sent you a link to, that walks you through it from step to step to step. So it gets you through the procurement, it gets you through, you can look at our maps, you can look at the um, device need. And so far between March and now, we've eaten that number down for devices um, by about 160,000. So we're down to 500,000 devices needed. It's about 25%. And then we've also added over 500 public Wi-Fi hotspots in libraries. And we pushed out into 36 di districts public Wi-Fi hotspots. So now we're working district by district to get home access. So please, please, um, you know, work within your district to make that work. We've also pushed out about between philanthropic funds and um, industry provider funds and the federal funds that we moved into this strategic initiative. We've pushed out over $23 million. So just know that, and that's not counting the CARES Act, which most districts are using to um, push into their budget holes. <laughs> so um, we're asking for more money from the federal government. And um, um, Kathleen, it is in that restart guide that I just sent. So I have all, I don't have the outcomes that I just mentioned, but the restart guide has, it walks you through all the data that I just mentioned. Uh, so Kayla, we have another question and I like this one. Um, so this is from Kimberly Hewitt, I think out of West Georgia. She says, in your mind, what is the role of the instructional technology specialist and the media specialist in the broadening access to participation and computing movement? Essential. <laughs> <laughs> so what I found is it's often the media specialist, because um, even oftentimes, if you don't have, uh, many school districts don't, or many schools, smaller schools, especially in elementary, they don't have a technology specialist. They mm -hmm. might have a media specialist. Um, and so oftentimes these roles are combined in small schools. Um, and oftentimes they're the ones who have to kind of take it on first. It's kind of like maker spaces um, where they're the first ones to really investigate and take it on. And then it feeds into a combined effort between them and the classroom teacher, sort of like how you use library books in that way too. Um, so, it's going to be essential, but your your school leader has to create a team, and they're that that and so they might not know how to do this. So you might have to go to your school leader and say, "Hey, we need a computer science team, and I want our IT professional, our media specialist, and any teachers who want to take this on to just start working together." And within that, it's it's not going to be possible in a school for just one teacher to to take it and run, and then suddenly you feel like you have a full program. Excellent. All right, I think we were right at time, but I think that was a great um, <laughs> a great history lesson and way to bring it to uh, a real place where we are right now and the, the, the vital need for computer science. Yeah. Um, and I think that last point about having a team and having the school leader uh, create the team, that helps out tremendously. Um, I know that any work that I've done is because I have a leader that helps me, supports me um, in anything in sports innovation. Um, so that is how we got as far as we've gotten this far in Georgia. Um, so thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Um, everybody, we have another set of sessions that's starting in about five minutes. Um, uh, if you need any, if you wanna reach out to uh, Dr. Dooley, uh, uh, I think she has a profile in the people's tab and, you know, she's available at the DOE website. So um, thanks a lot. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. You're doing the work. I appreciate it. This is so in, in, important for all of us. All right.